and then be praying for pastor during the 11 o'clock hour, pray for our choir as they prepare for the cantata, which will be next Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. And of course, we have our discipleship groups this Wednesday. Hope you're involved in a discipleship group. Those are a great blessing to us. And uh, you see some of these upcoming events, uh, not, not just to mention the uh, Resurrection Sunday next Sunday, but also, of course, our community event here on the property across the way, beginning at 11 o'clock. And there's a sign-up sheet out there for those that want to participate in helping with that, set up, uh, work during the event, and then the cleanup aspects of that. And then you see the Greater Hickory Mission opportunity. And then three weeks from today, the uh, quarterly business meeting. And then there are some other items. The junior camp this summer for the young people. And then remember the couples retreat in the fall that we had, uh, had been mentioning. And continue to pray for each other. Pray for the provision for Tabernacle and what the Lord have, would have for us. And then I'm going to be mentioning prayer requests when we open in prayer here in a moment. So a lot of activities that are ongoing in this spring of the year. Missionary letter today is from the Velasquez family. That's Julio and Andrea. And they minister in Spain. And they're actually in a city that's about 12 miles from Madrid named Parla, Spain. P-A-R-L-A. And they have a ministry there in which they are he's brother Velasquez is pastoring the church plant there they're working on another church plant that's near to where they are in another uh, municipality of Madrid the town they're in has 128,000 people in it they had a recent youth meeting in which 10 churches were involved and brother Velasquez mentioned that there were 70 young people there from 10 different churches he also uh, mentions they had a missions month during the month of November of 2023. And they also had a ladies Christmas gathering that uh, had 30 ladies in attendance. And he knew of several in that group that did not have a testimony of salvation. Two of them were Muslim women. So he's asking us to pray for those ladies and uh, for all those activities that are ongoing. He also mentions that they've had re two recent salvations in the church itself, a man named Louis Daniel and one named Pedro, and he's praying for spiritual growth for them as they disciple these young men. But the ministry is doing very well, and uh, they are thankful for our prayers and financial support, and that's uh, the Velasquez family, Julio and Andrea in Parla, Spain. All right, I'm open in prayer, and then we'll get into our lesson. Father, we praise you. Thank you that we can meet together today. Thank you for the freedom you've given us to worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we thank you for Tabernacle, this local body that you have established, part of the bride of Christ. And Father, we pray that we would grow closer to you, to grow to be more like the Lord and that you would use the services here, the preaching of your word, the service that you've allowed us to participate in, in serving you here at Tabernacle to make us grow stronger, to be a more faithful Christian, to be one more about your business in these last days. Father, we pray for our staff. We pray for our pastor today. We pray for the ministries of Tabernacle, our missionaries. Thank you for the Velasquez there in Spain, and we pray you continue to bless their ministry. Thank you for this new church plant that Brother Velasquez is assisting in. Thank you for these two young men who were recently saved. We pray for their growth spiritually, that you would guide in their life and use them in the direction of service that you would have for their life. We pray for these unsaved people that have been visiting the church, these ladies from at the uh, ladies conference they had. And Father, we pray that you would open doors, that they could uh, give them the gospel further, that your Holy Spirit would work in their heart, and you would accomplish great things in their life. Thank you for the missions month they have, and for the young people emphasis that they have there at the church. Father, we pray for their provision and protection, and that you would uh, strengthen and guide them. Thank you for that we can bring requests to you. We pray for uh, Brother Phil. Uh, home from the hospital, that you would help him, and for Brother Bollinger, and for Richard T., 
in the hospital. We pray for the physical needs that they have. We pray for Miss Pisani with this treatment for cancer that she's undergoing. And we pray for comfort and grace for Jeremy and his family and the home going of his mother and for Brittany and her family and the home going of her grandmother. Pray for Miss Powell and uh, Sean Shepard and Richard Jackson, Frank York, Lori Rao. Father, all with physical needs that you're very well aware of. And for uh, Miss Eggers and for Ed Bish and also for Miss Byers. And Father, we would pray that you would have your hand on each one of these needs. And also, Father, we pray that you would minister to the unspoken needs and other needs that each one of us here and meeting across the way and on this campus have in our hearts this morning. We pray for the upcoming activities. Strengthen our choirs. They prepare for the cantata. And we pray for the resurrection service next Sunday. And also, Father, for... Uh, the services today that you would guide our pastor at the 11 o'clock hour and then also during our communion service tonight we pray it would be a time of we could examine ourselves that you would use uh, your preached word to guide us and father we thank you for the provision you made here at tabernacle and strengthening and, and guiding those that are involved in the finances and uh, father for your uh, work on the hearts of your people uh, to give sacrificially to the needs that you lay on their heart. We pray that this would be something that would be a sweet savor to you. Fathers, we study your word today. We would ask that you would guide uh, in our heart and use the Bible to engraft within our heart and use the words of your word to strengthen us today. And we'll be careful to praise you for all you do. In Christ's name, amen. Well, today we are going to be in Genesis chapter 4. And for the past several weeks, it's hard to believe, after uh, almost 10, over 10 lessons, we're just in Genesis chapter 4. But we've examined these scriptures very carefully, obviously, and, and the Lord has given us a tremendous amount of information uh, regarding creation and regarding, unfortunately, the fallen heart of man. And that's what we're going to be looking at today when we look at Genesis chapter 4 in the account of Cain killing Abel. That's a study that we're looking at today. Now, the foundation for this, of course, has to do with the fact that man now has fallen. He has lost fellowship with God. We saw that last week in speaking of Adam and Eve and their sin uh, in the garden. And immediately they died spiritually. And obviously, they eventually died physically. But leading up to that, God was prepared and He made a way to bring them back to Him, to reconcile them to Him. He provided through the blood sacrifice of an animal, made coats of skins for them to cover them, and also set an example to them of how they would be conducting themselves once they were expelled from the garden out into the world. A world that was now cursed with sin. And although they had previously enjoyed the dominion and the subdu subduing of animals, that was lost. And now the animals had a fear and a dread of them. However, they no longer could subdue the animals, speaking of the animal world. But he had obviously, God had obviously given them instruction, given them instruction in worship and how to approach his throne in, in that. And it required, of course, this blood sacrificial system that he established under the first covenant, which would exist for many years prior to the beginning of the second covenant. But during that time, as they went out into the world, the Bible begins to give us an account of what the world was like and what it would become. And as you might imagine, it's exactly as we see it today. A world full of sin and corruption with only one solution, and that is the gospel. No other solution. So today in Genesis chapter 4, we're going to look at some of these early events in the life of a family that God established on the earth. 
and sent them out to replenish the earth. And you remember the end of, verse, end of chapter 3 of Genesis does not end on a negative note. Oh no, it ends on a positive note. You know, Adam says, Eve is the mother of all the living. And this is a positive statement. In other words, this plan of redemption that God has made completely restores that relationship that we lost in the garden to Satan. And has given us a hope. Oh yes, there is now vanity. There is now vanity in, in creation and in the created things that God created. There is a vanity there. And that vanity causes Adam and Eve and all their offspring to seek the hope that's in Christ. That was the purpose of that vanity. So now we're going to look at chapter 4. And we're going to look at that in three points this morning. The first is a time process. In other words, the world has changed. And now the world is going to begin a process in its fallen state that requires the redemptive work of Christ. Yes, people will have to look forward in time to the time when the fullness of time would come and God would send His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them. So the entire Old Testament Scripture is all about that time process. And this is the first couple years of it we're going to look at today. And now, us, looking back 2,024 years ago approximately, we are looking back on that time process. But we are in the same time process. The exact same sins, the exact same iniquity and wickedness that we carry in our deceitfully and desperately wicked heart was present in Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve after the fall. So our first point is a time process. Our second point is a testimony of righteousness. Praise the Lord, God made a way. Amen. And that way is clearly presented. It was presented last week, and it's presented today. And given, given as an invitation to an unsaved person who unfortunately rejects it. So our second point is a testimony of righteousness. Our final point is a sad one, a torrent of rebellion. That's exactly what we're going to see in the life of Cain. The first person to reject Christ, Cain. Torrent of rebellion. So let's look here beginning in Genesis chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived... And bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, I mentioned this to you last week, but in all likelihood, Eve thought that Cain was going to be the seed that would bruise a serpent's head. The first person born. The first person with a belly button came to the earth. Cain. Verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Yeah, these are two forms of toil that God instituted in a world of vanity. Remember, he told Adam that by the sweat of your brow, you're going to be working with soil and toil. You're going to be working with thorns and thistles. That's accomplished, and that's what's happening. These people had to survive. Cain and Abel were born into the same household. And it's very clear to us from the next verse that Adam and Eve instructed them on the ways of God because of what they did. They understood that they had to work, first of all. They had to toil. They were going to sweat in doing so before they return to the ground in physical death someday. But it's very clear that they were instructed by their parents. And then verse 3 is where our first point comes from. And in the process of time, 
Remember this, that every day we get up, we're in the process of time. An evil world with an evil heart only reconciled by the blood of Christ. That's it. It's a simple life, actually, this process of time. We live day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, and it passes. But it is the process of time. All right, let's read on to verse 3. It came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So Cain knew that he had to have an offering to the Lord. Now, why would he know that? Well, it had to have been instructed to him by his parents. There was no one else to teach him. We don't know anything about his relationship to God at this point. But we would surmise that Adam had instructed him in the need for forgiveness of sin. As a result of that, he brought this offering unto the Lord. Now there are some peculiar things about this offering, as you know. Number one, it did not contain blood. And remember, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The other thing we would say about this offering is it was the fruit of his hands. This was something that he determined would be sufficient and should be sufficient. And there's a whole world out there that believe they know what is sufficient for salvation. Cain was the first one. So we note that, this offering. And then, verse 4, first part, we see Abel, his brother, who was a keeper of the sheep. Notice, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Note, Abel not only understood that it required a blood sacrifice, he understood it required a sacrifice without blemish. Firstling, that's what a firstling is. This is, this is the best. This was the beginning. This is what he had, the best of what he had. And as you know, the fat is a very important part of the offering. We won't go into that, but, but it, it serves to show the importance of that offering. That it is preeminent in what he's doing in his line of work and paying tribute to God and offering a blood sacrifice so there's a difference between the activities of Cain and Abel right from the get-go in this process of time. This, i got to be careful with that, but this time process that's happening. Now notice the end of verse 4. Now we're going to see our second point, and that is a testimony of righteousness. So notice the end of verse 4. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So Abel had a testimony of righteous living. He understood he was a sinner. He understood that God required the shedding of blood to reconcile his sin. And he made that offering with the firstlings of his flock and the fat of that firstling. And God accepted it. It says there, the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Notice, he includes both. So in other words, through the offering, which was properly given, Abel developed this relationship with God. So it was a personal relationship that's being described. You know, that was one of, that's going to be one of the problems that Cain has. He doesn't understand the need for that personal relationship with God. All right, let's read on. We're thinking on our second point now, the testimony of righteousness. Notice verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. Same word, respect. He respects one, he does not respect the other. And I mentioned to you already that the word respect here is speaking of acceptance. It's speaking of sufficiency. It's speaking of 
following the proper methodology of worship. That's what the word is speaking of. Cain's offering was of no value to God because of the fruit of his hands. Abel's offering was a sweet-smelling savor because it contained blood, which God required. And notice the response that Cain had at the end of verse 5. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Two different characteristics of Cain that are given to us there. One is wrath or wroth, anger, and the other is a result of it, a falling of his countenance. If you know someone for very long and you get to know them and they're an unsaved person, you're going to eventually find that they will demonstrate a fallen countenance. They'll demonstrate wrath. They'll demonstrate the fruit of sinfulness in their life. It'll be demonstrated. Now, it may not be demonstrated the first time you meet them, but with time, it will show. Their countenance is going to demonstrate. Yeah, the contrary is true also. When you meet somebody you've never met before and you, you speak to them and, and get to know them very briefly, you can all, often, I bet you would, te- you would agree with me on this, you can often sense that there's something about them that makes you think they're a born again Christian. You can detect that in the very behavior of a person before they even tell you they go to church and they were saved at such and such a time in the past. It's because that fellowship is there that the Holy Spirit brings between two people. All right, so this is a situation that Cain is in. Now notice what happens in verse 6. The Lord ministers to Cain, much in the way that he ministers to Adam and Eve after the fall. Look at it with me. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? What's he doing? He's trying to get Cain to confess to the anger that he has. And to see himself and to see his his countenance as fallen and allow him to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit that he has transgressed against God in his offering. He's doing something that God told him not to do. So what a show of mercy and grace on the part of God in the life of Cain to ask him these questions. He's he's trying to build a relationship with Cain so that Cain would see what he needs to do. And then verse 7, he goes on. And remember, he's doing this in the setting of the righteous testimony of his brother. In verse 7, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. You know, what's God saying to Cain there? He's saying, listen, if you follow what your parents taught you and what I have instructed you to do in worship and in sacrifice, then you're going to be accepted. God is trying to get Cain to understand those things. This is the same type of process that occurs in a person unsaved under the preaching of the gospel. They go through this cognitive process under conviction. As the Holy Spirit is trying to get them to see themselves as a sinner and to see the solution is the blood and the blood only, one way. That's what God is doing here with Cain. And then read the end of verse 7 with me. And if thou doest not well, you know, there's only two options. <laughs> you can either accept Christ or you can reject Christ. You have no other option. You can't ignore it. When you ignore it, you're rejecting it. 
the gospel always requires a decision. And delaying it is to reject it. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So Cain, this is what's really wrong with your heart. It is sinful. And you have not accepted that fact that you are a sinner. And that wording, lieth at the door, is speaking of something that is about ready to show up in your life. It's saying here is something that is brewing in your heart and it's going to manifest in your life. It's coming if you don't do something about it. And then God gives him some instruction at the end of verse 7. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. This is speaking about the relationship between Cain and Abel if Cain would submit to God's direction and ask his brother for a firstling and sacrifice it like his brother did and his offering be accepted. Abel and him would be in fellowship with each other. And he's the elder, right? They, but they would be in fellowship with each other. That's a simple task that occurs. Just like Christians in this room. We come here to worship together. When we look at each other, we, we can say, hey, that's my brother or sister in Christ. We're saved by the same blood. Cain and Abel had that opportunity, or Cain had that opportunity. All right, let's read on verse 8. Actually, this is the beginning of our third point. So the Lord laid it out very perfectly for Cain and what he needed to do up through verse 7. He needed to have a blood sacrifice and he could reconcile himself with Abel. And I'd mentioned to you that unfortunately that does not happen. So we'll enter our third point here, and it is a torrent of rebellion. The time process was ongoing. The testimony of righteousness was given by Abel to his brother, and then by God to Cain in trying to reconcile him back. I was thinking about the song, the 90 and 9. You know, God doesn't say much about Abel, but he goes and searches for Cain, who is lost in the wilderness of sin. What does he do? He rebels. A torrent of rebellion. Look in verse 8 with me. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now why did Abel, in speaking to Cain, why did Cain decide to kill his brother? Was it because Abel had done something to Cain? Was it because Abel perhaps refused to give him a firstling of his flock? You know, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about that. It's quite simply that God was hated by Cain and the person that Cain could send that punishment to or that disdain or hatred to was Abel. You know, all the persecution that occurs in this world of God's people have that as its origin. And you remember that the Apostle Paul, who at, when he was Saul of Tarsus, and the people that stoned Stephen laid their coats at his feet while they were stoning Stephen. You know, Paul accentuated that martyrdom of Stephen. He caused it to happen. Why did he do that? When Stephen preached that testimony to that crowd that gnashed him with their teeth, the Apostle Paul knew everything Stephen taught, but he interpreted it a totally different way. And he had wrath, he had anger, he had a torrent of rebellion, Saul of Tarsus did, 
Because in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says he was breathing out slaughterings and disdain for the Christians. Who was he really in dislike of? God himself. I mean, you remember later in Acts chapter 9 when he's on the road to Damascus and the Lord appears to him in a light and blinds him. The Lord said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That's who was being persecuted. That's who Saul was attempting to persecute. Not those people that he tried to get letters from a chief priest to put him in jail and to kill him like he did Stephen. So this is exactly the same situation that Cain and Abel is in. Cain killed Abel because he did not like what God had told him to do. He was in rebellion against it. So he rose up against him. We note the same thing in Revelation when the Antichrist will be on the earth. He's going to do the same thing with Christians that get saved during the tribulation period. His hatred for God is such that he's going to tr make sure he slaughters every one of those people that get saved. And the only one that he's not going to be able to slaughter are the 144,000, which God is going to protect miraculously, as you remember from our study in Revelation. But that's an example of the same mindset that we see in Cain in working with Abel. Abel, to him, represents the righteousness of God and reveals to him his sinful heart. So what's he want to do? He wants to kill. And that's exactly what he does in a torrent of rebellion. Now you would think that at this point that, the Holy, that, that God would say, well, Cain, you finished it. You did everything that you needed to do to be cast out forever. We don't really understand the grace of God. We'll never in all eternity understand the attributes of God. That's going to be one of the beautiful things about heaven is learning more and more about Him. So we note that here in verse 9. Notice, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Again, questions. These questions are just like the questions that God asked to Adam and Eve in the garden, right, after they sinned. Notice Cain's response. And he said, I know not. That's a direct lie to the creator of the universe. An absolute direct lie. Now that is bold to be able to do that. That is full rejection. To be able to lie to that degree. There's no remorse there. He has no guilt about that whatsoever. He is in a furious state like Saul of Tarsus was in Acts 9 verse 1. Am I my brother's keeper? The end of verse 9. This is a derogatory statement toward God. Saying, are you assigning to me something that I'm not responsible for. What a derogatory statement. Out and out rejection of any ministering that God is trying to do to this young man. In verse 10, we see the results of this torrent of rebellion. And he said, what hast thou done? This is God speaking to Cain once again. Another question. He's trying to incite a little bit of guilt <laughs> in the heart of, a of Cain. To let him understand where he is spiritually. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And we won't turn there, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the Bible describes the blood of Abel as having a testimony. Just like the blood of Stephen. Just like the blood of martyred Christians. They have a testimony that God uses. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. 
all the days of my life. And my life is going to continue in heaven. But the goodness and mercy that God demonstrated to my life will be a testimony even after I'm gone. How many people do you know that have went home to be with the Lord and their testimony lives on? So did Abel's. So did Stephen's. So did many others that were sawn asunder. Like the Bible talks about in the latter parts of Hebrews. Verse 12. When thou tillest the ground, it shall be not henceforth yield unto her, her str- thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. In other words, he is being expelled from his family situation. And in verse 13, one of the saddest parts of all, one of the saddest verses in the Bible, every unsaved person makes this statement. And Cain said in the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. At least Cain did recognize that he could not, he did not have the spiritual ability to bear that punishment. It would require an eternity in hell to bear. He knew that he couldn't bear it. But he chose to try. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to say to the unsaved people on the earth during the tribulation period. God is in heaven with those saints. He doesn't care about you. We will bring a new world order into this world, and we'll change this world. We'll use every avenue to make this world greater and better. It'll be a utopia. Those are the kinds of things that he's going to say to those during the tribulation period. That same attitude is in the heart of Cain. We'll see here in a moment. All right, let's read on with this torrent of rebellion. Verse 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. Notice, remember what Adam did after he sinned in the garden? He hid. His son did the same thing when he rejected Christ. He hid. And he accepted his punishment. Notice, I shall be a fugitive and vagabond, just like God told him. Two verses up. In the earth it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Then verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That does not only speak of geography. That speaks of mentality. That speaks of idea. That speaks of attitude. I do not want the Lord to have anything to do with me. That's what Cain's saying there when he went out from the presence of the Lord. And the Bible tells us he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Now, you might suspect that Cain would have lived a life that would have been perhaps one that was turned to be very little. But from a worldly perspective, he was a very successful man. Read on. Look in verse 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city. And called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad. And Irad begat Mahujelah. And Mahujel begat Methusel. And Methusel begat Lamech. And then you read on. But skip down to verse 21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and the organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. So an artificer of brass and iron is someone that's involved in manufacturing and utilization of metals. So we already note that Cain went to Nod. He married his sister, as you know, had children, And they became very technologically advanced. 
They invented things. They were involved in the arts. I mean, from a world's perspective, this city that they developed, Enoch, was probably an incredible place to live, except God had nothing to do with it. The presence of the Lord was not allowed in that city. You know, I think of Cain as being the first humanist. And to finish up, I want to read to you some excerpts from the Humanist Manifesto. I've done this before. But they are so applicable to the life of Cain. And I think it would be interesting for you to hear them. The Humanist Manifesto, there's been three of them now, but this is a second one. And it was written in 1973. And if you want to read it, the whole thing, you can go to the Humanist, American Humanist website, and all of their manifestos are there. But this is the second one, like I mentioned, from 1973. And all those that are, are signatories on the Humanist Manifesto are listed. And there will be some names on there that you know that are on there. So when I read these excerpts from the Humanist Manifesto from 1973, what, what I want you to think about is Cain's attitude and how he behaved and acted in this situation. All right, here we go. Humanist Manifesto. We believe, however, that traditional, dogmatic, or authoritarian religions that place revelation, God, ritual, or creed above human needs and experience do a disservice to the human species. We find insufficient evidence for a belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of survival and fulfillment of the human race. You know, Cain did not utilize any spirituality in his life after he departed from the presence of God as far as we know. There's nothing in the Bible to support that. I am reading on. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. Nature may indeed be broader and deeper than we not now know. Any new discoveries, however, will but enlarge our knowledge of the natural. I'm just reading several parts of this. We reject traditional religious morality that deny humans a full appreciation of their own potentialities and responsibilities. The wicked heart of man should not be restrained by any scriptural truth, is what they're saying. And then here's the last phrase. But we can discover no divine purpose or providence for the human species. While there is much that we do not know, humans are responsible for what we are or will become. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. Promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusionary and harmful. This is a 1973 Humanist Manifesto, which is a picture of the life of Cain and anyone that is unsaved. And humanism, as you probably know, is the number one religion in the world. Number one. By far. So perhaps this lesson is not too positive. The beginning of Adam and Eve's existence when they were expelled from the garden started a time process. A time process in which God made very positive. Abel demonstrated that time process and the positivity of it in following the commands of God. But raised in the same home, another young man rejected that time process that God had established. He rejected a testimony of righteousness that Abel had and decided to bear his own sin in a torrent of rebellion. Oh, yes, he was successful on the earth. There have been many that have 
by God's grace, been given great success materially under the sun. Even the writer of Ecclesiastes. But many unsaved also. But they died lost. We don't know if Cain got saved. But judging by what the scripture tells us, it seems like it would have been unlikely. So next week, we're going to proceed from this point in time. And we're going to look at what happens on the earth leading up to, as you know, the flood. So this will be our study next week. As we look at what civilization evolves into with a wicked heart of man. But God does maintain his remnant throughout time. We understand that. Glory to God for that. Amen. All right, let's close in prayer and we'll be done. Father, we praise you for our time together today. Thank you for the truth of your word and thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be reconciled to you by the blood of Christ. Father, we pray that you would use us this week. We pray that you would guide in our lives and help us to be submitted to you at all times, to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Keep us clean and pure in our minds and heart. We pray that you would guide our pastor in the message to follow and also in our Lord's Supper service tonight. We pray that Christ would be honored and glorified in that and looking forward to the other upcoming events. In Christ's name we pray, amen.